record. Oh, look, already some ants. So all my classes are overlapping with each other, and it's it's getting to me. So I told you that like two weeks ago, we were doing mitosis meiosis in genetics, and that's why last week you all got mitosis meiosis in here. And I was like, okay, hold on. Then this week in um, the class I just came from, it's mitosis and meiosis. We just talked. We just did a lab on photosynthesis. We had to talk a little bit of photosynthesis in here. Today in my cell bio class, we talked photosynthesis. And we also did the resting membrane potential, which is Thursday, which is what we also talked about three weeks ago in my saddleback class. So it's like everything is blurring together. And we're doing chromosomal abnormalities also this week. And then classical genetics next week in the Saddleback class. And next week is cr chromosomal abnormalities in genetics. So I, I don't know what's going on with anything. So if I start talking and repeating, like you, you've already said that, then yeah. The panic. So, let's talk animals. So, animals are different than plants, if you haven't figured that out. Objectives. One of the first things that we should probably ask is, what is an animal? And what makes that question, because, like, we never answer the question of, what's a plant? Because usually it's, oh, it's a thing that does photosynthesis. Except, for the parasitic plants that don't do photosynthesis. Oh. Well, it's a thing that... Crap, I don't know. Like, what are plants? Like, if you had to come up with the definition, could we come up with the definition? The answer is, I don't know, but I know one when I see one. Like, that, that'll tell me that what, what a plant is. Well, then, what's an animal? I, 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 I'm not sure either. We use these terms. You, you all took an entire course where you had to use these terms. Did it ever cross your mind? And maybe it did. Of asking, how do we know it's this and not that? Like, how, how did we draw the lines between each of these groups? One of the things about animals, and even then, it's not entirely functional is they have tissues. They make nice distinct tissues and usually there's going to be some type of information tissue and there's going to be some type of movement tissue until you look at like a sponge and then oh crap it all fell apart on us again. So what's an animal? As far as we can tell, there's one characteristic that, that's in common with all animals. And it's like the one unifying factor, which is screwy. Animals make collagen. Animals make collagen. Everything else kind of variable as to what it, if it's an animal or not. But animals make collagen. Plants turn out to have the potential for unlimited growth. Huh? Except that plants stop at height. Yeah, because then they kill themselves. But they can have unlimited cell divisions. They don't have our termination problem. They don't have the cancer problem that we have to freak out about. They can just keep going. That seems to be what makes a plant a plant. And animals, it's, we make a stupid, well, what's that good for? Do, do we know what this is? Collagen is not a cell. 
Collagen's a protein. If you like soups, you can tell when soups are made from a packet as opposed to when they were made with someone who actually took a carcass and put that carcass into that salted water with all the other stuff for a long period of time. Because that brothy taste is collagen. That's what you're liking. It's the collagen. It's going to make up a lot of your tissues. So, animals come in a whole bunch of shapes and sizes. Some of them move. Some animals do not. What do we call the animals that don't move? Sessile. Yes, they're sessile animals. They're not immobile. They're sessile. Name a sessile one. Barnacles, indeed. As adults are sessile. Do you know any other sessiles? Corals, indeed, as adults are sessile. Because as juveniles, they're mobile. Sponges, indeed. <laughs> Although sponges are weird because they're like a weird aggregation of cells that can kind of sort of live on their own, but they kind of do better together. So sponges are weird. I was just bracing to see if any of you said an anemone. That never make that hand gesture again. That hand gesture means something. Do not do that again. We will block that from our minds. A sea anemone. We don't need to go there. So a sea anemone is not Cecil. Because they can crawl, they can move. You don't normally see it because they're slow. It's kind of like thinking of a sea star. You call them starfish. They're not fish, so why call them a fish? Like a seahorse. It's not a horse of the sea. It's a fish that we say looks like a horse, even though... No, it don't. So technically, a seahorse is a horse fish, and a sea star is actually... Sorry, a starfish is a sea star. Just saying. Some move, some don't, but it turns out that is not what I wanted to do, that what animals are capable of doing is they have dynamic interactions with the environment. They can change what's going on. Plants take it. Animals fight back. Sometimes the way that we fight back is we move. And if we can't move, we're going to start to manipulate our surroundings to make it okay for us. Not all, but a good chunk of the animals turn out to also have two points of interaction with the environment. And that's because most animals... are tubes. Most animals are tubes. You have an interaction on the outside, and you have interactions on the inside. Is that true for us? Of course it is. Your body is constantly monitoring, monitoring your skin, but it's also constantly monitoring your gut. Because your gut is a tube. No, it's not. Of course it is. Starts on one end, ends at the other. You just happen to have little plugs that you can open and close, but it's a tube. When was the last time you put food inside your body? The answer is, you never put food inside your body. Food has always been out side of you. Think about that. You have never put food inside of your body because your stomach is outside of you. Your intestines are outside of you because it's a tube. 
And it's a continuous layer of skin all the way through to the end. Which, the more you think about it, is going to really bother you. But it's also going to explain how we regulate ourselves in terms of secretions. If the more you can get into that mindset of the outside is the inside, and literally the real inside of you is the space between the tube and this, that's the real inside of you, it will change how things work. If we look in terms of the anatomy of all or virtually all animals, this is ignoring the smallest and the least structurally interesting of them all, but they make collagen. You all remember the colonial set of Actually, it's such a weird group you might not have even heard of them. They're called placozoans. Were you told about placozoans? That's a no. Or it's a, I blocked that class out. It was terrifying the entire time of having to memorize all this stuff, and I don't know what was happening, but make it stop. Please, please make it stop. So, amoeba, single-celled. Take one of these, just make it multicellular. Ta-da, you got placozoans. That's what they are. They, they just look at like a big old blobby thing. But they make collagen. So if I ignore those and now take a look at everything else, the basic requirements. We have to have a place to put nutrients in and get the wastes out. Sometimes the entry portal and the exit portal are the same spot. Sometimes it's going to be through the skin. Sometimes we'll have some specialized structures, a specialized tube. That will allow this. We're going to have a need for circulation, kind of like how plants had their own version of circulation. We will have our own version too. Much like how some plants are so small they don't need circulation, there are some animals that are so thin they don't need a circulation. They just use diffusion to let everything happen. Once you get past that in plants, it's xylem and phloem all the way. With us, meaning animals, we have some options. We can have what we call a closed circulation, meaning whatever's inside these tubes stays inside the tubes. Blood stays in the blood tubes. Or we can have what's known as an open circulation. The blood can dump out and get sucked back in. Name an organism that does that, where it dumps the blood out into a cavity and then sucks the blood back in. Who drove here? Like, literally, you were in a car and you came here. For car. For those of you who raise your hands, during the springtime, especially if you're driving on a freeway and it's open road, Tell me about your windshield. Pardon? Covered in, bugs. Covered in bugs. Tell me about the bug guts. Does it look like it's a bunch of body parts, or does it look like just a bomb exploded? It's a bomb that exploded. How do you get a bomb to explode? You need to have an area where all the blood's hanging out, and then it just pops. What would happen if you were to hit a person like that? You go to jail. That's right. Don't do it. That's right. Uh uh uh. But would it leave the same type of splat? No, it wouldn't. It would actually leave other patterns. Insects have a blood cavity. Insects turn out to have partial circulation where they have their blood in tubes some of the time, and then other times it just in a space. And you can see where that space is because when you hit that bug at 80 miles an hour, it goes pop. So we have different versions of circulation. We're going to have a need to deal with wastes. 
because unlike plants that like to play around with carbohydrates, we're going to deal with proteins. And proteins come with nitrogenous wastes, and we need to process those nitrogenous wastes, especially because they are toxic. These are toxic wastes. So we need to have mechanisms to deal with the toxicity. In part due to the nature of the fact that we don't have cell walls, and by not having cell walls, we are far more mobile. We have mobility, but mobility requires coordination. So we need to have some way to move, but we also need to have a way to coordinate our movements, which requires two extra sets of things. All of this is accomplished, all of this, through four tissues. Plants got three tissues. We have four. Only two of them are similar. It's going to be the last one that's super different. <clears throat> what we're going to notice is with animals, all these tissues are going to be bathed in fluid at all times. The name of that fluid is going to be called interstitial fluid, meaning tissue fluid. Typically, what you're going to say is blood. That is not the real thing to talk about. Any of you know a diabetic? If you know a diabetic, raise your hand. If you didn't raise your hand, you're a liar, or you're ignorant. Every one of you knows a diabetic. Guaranteed every one of you knows a diabetic. What do you have to worry about with diabetics? There's sugar. We control it with the insulin, but we have to worry about the sugar. How do we measure it? With the glucose monitor. How do you check the glucose in the glucose monitor? Drop of blood. So we're worrying about their, the glucose in their blood. No, we don't care about the blood. The blood is a tiny bit of your fluid. What we worry about is interstitial glucose. So when you say, my blood glucose is 90 mg per mil, you really are saying my interstitial fluid glucose is 90 mg per mil. It's interstitial fluid that is important in animals. No. So Plasma is a blood phenomenon. Interstitial fluid is the, the rest of you phenomenon. So if we were to sit there and if we were to repeat us desiccating out our plants, but we're going to do it instead with, we won't pick a mouse because I'll freak some of you out. Let's go with, um, they're all going to go extinct anyway, so we'll pick a frog. So we're going to take a frog. Everything is getting polluted, and with the climate change, there are fungi that the frogs can't fight off, and it's killing them all. Let's just face facts. We're going to, like, it is potential, probably not within our lifetimes, but maybe your kids and my kids. There might not be amphibians. Like, full blown, legit possibility. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take Kermit, and we're going to say, Kermit, thank you so much for teaching us science, and it is very hard being green. Dead. We're going to get its mass. We're going to put it into the desiccator. We're going to dry it out probably for a day or two. When it's done drying out, we'll compare the wet mass to the dry mass. What we're going to see is a lot of the mass turned out to be 
like most of it's going to be gone. You probably notice that with your plants, like a lot of the mass disappeared. But where's most of that mass? It's going to be water. So if we were to sit there and take that water volume and then put it into categories as to where we could find it inside the body, if you could figure out the number of cells you have and the average volume of the cells, what you'd realize rather quickly is roughly 60% of all that water is trapped inside your cells. So 40% of that water that was lost is going to be found everywhere else. Where is the everywhere else? It's interstitial fluid. And of that water, a very tiny subset is what we would call your blood, which is where plasma kicks in. Most of your water is in your cells. Once we get away from your cells, it's in interstitial fluid. A very small subset of interstitial fluid is blood. It's why the next time you need to fall and get a scrape, number one, you don't ever fall and get a scrape. That's why you have younger siblings. So if you're going to fall, no, oh, grab them and throw them and watch them get scraped. So they should, you know, they scrape off, you know, greater, greater with cheese style, a whole bunch of layers of skin, but it doesn't bleed. How does it look underneath the scrape? Is it dry? No, it's not bleeding, but it's still wet. The interstitial fluid is leaking out. You are, your cells are bathed in interstitial fluid at all times. There are four types of tissues. Everything that we have, we can break it down into one of these four. And they're nice and clean cut, so that's kind of nice. Number one, epithelial. This is like saying the dermal tissues of plants. So it's the outside. Epithelial tissues are coverings and linings. Meaning, if I can touch a solid object, that surface I am touching is epithelium. I pull a heart out, Temple of Doom style. You grabbing the outside of that heart, you are feeling epithelium. You reach on in because you're cleaning out a stomach. You reach inside the stomach. The inside of the stomach, that's epithelium. The outside of the stomach, what you're touching, it's epithelium. The outside of all things in your body is epithelium. It's always going to be a covering or a lining. If, you, like, if I were to take a blood vessel, yes, the outside of the blood vessel is epithelium. The inside of the blood vessel is epithelium. The tubes that make up your kidneys epithelium because it's a surface or a lining some of them are too small for us to see but they're there some of these surfaces well with these surfaces that is the point of contact that is where all interactions with the outside environment occurs everything is going to interact with epithelium our knowledge of the outside world is epithelium whether it's in your gut or the temperature of this room. It's epithelium that's going to do the interaction. We obviously need to have some things in there to help then relay the signal. Depending on where it is, bless you, it can be constantly falling off because it's interacting with the outside, which means these need to be able to regenerate. Epithelial tissues are the ones that fall off, and we got to make them again. Which is why if you're going to get a that word, which one is it probably going to be? An epithelium. Why is it that when you have cancer treatments, your hair falls out? Because your hair is on the outside. It is an epithelium. And if we're killing off the cells that are always dividing, well, what are they? It's going to be your hair, 
It's also going to be your intestines. How can you tell someone's going through chemotherapy? They tend to have intestinal issues. They don't want to eat. They lose lots of weight. Why? Because sometimes if it's not a great treatment, it's killing off their ability to absorb food. It's a surface or epithelium is a surface or a lining. We can actually explain a lot of things just off of that. We're going to do a lab where you're going to come across their names. Their names are going to drive you nuts, even though the names are perfectly logical. They're going to be named after what they look like and how many stacks of them do you have. Just for the sake of saying it, their shapes are either called squamous, cuboidal, or columnar. Squamous means a scale. So what do I call it? A crepe. Squamous, think of them as crepes. They're round and they're super skinny. Cuboidal, sounds like cube. Columnar, sounds like column. What do they look like? One of them looks like that, one looks like that, one looks like that. If you're having a difficult time identifying them and they are stained, the clue is look at the nucleus. Squamous cells have squished, long, not very tall nuclei. Cuboidal, cuboidal so cubes, cubes are like equal sides. So it's nu their nuclei also look about same height and same width. Columnar, well, it's a tall, skinny cell, so they probably have tall, skinny nuclei. They come in two types of layers. This is su being super basic, but we can have simple. Well, what's the simplest number you can have? One. The other option is stratified. That's stratified. What's stratified? It's, it's stacked. So two or more. Usually when we say stratified, we mean two, with the exception of squamous. Squamous will stack dozens, if not a hundred of them, on top of each other. Where would we do that? Your skin. Option one. Option two is the horrible one because it's the everything else. Connective tissue. Connective tissue has three components, and it always has these three. It will have some type of cell. So all connective tissues have cells. They will all have what we refer to as a gel in fan well, in non normal words, it's going to maintain a particular extracellular matrix. So it's going to maintain a very particular outside environment, meaning it's going to have a certain set of chemicals always around it. And with that is going to come fibers. Fibers is a nice way of saying proteins. If you don't know the name of the cell, there's always a very good guess. And that's going to be the word fibroblast. You don't know what the cell of the particular connective tissue is? Uh, uh, fibroblast. And with a handful ex of exceptions, you're right. You got it. Good job. These fibroblasts maintain that fluid and the proteins. So the gels and the fibers are maintained by the cell. Sometimes we switch out the name of the cell. So if we were to have blood, we don't call them fibroblasts. We just call them 
blood cells. And of course, then we say, if I were to get a big stack of them, what color they turn out to be? They turn out to be red. We call them red cells. Usually, if you say red cells, we automatically know about the blood parts. So we don't need to even say blood cells. We just call them red cells. But if you want to sound smart, you call them what? Erythrocytes. Why would you do that? Because it means red cells. Makes it just sound smarter. Another set of them look white. So we call those white cells. But you want to sound smart. So we call them leukocytes. Erythro is red. Leuco means white. So if you have leukemia, emias, E-M-I-A, always mean, means something's going wrong with. So if you have leukemia, something's going wrong with your white cells. What do we mean by that? You have cancer of the white cells. Hooray. Why don't we have that for the red cells? Because the red cells die too quickly. They last about 120 days, then we kill them off. Where do we kill them off? An organ that you never have given any thought to, unless you've torn it, then, yeah, you've given it some thought, called your spleen. If you ever heard of your spleen, what's it good for? It takes out your red blood cells. Oh, okay. I can combine epithelium and connective tissues, and I make these funky things called membranes. Wait, membrane? You mean like, like cell membranes? No, different type of membrane. There's actually four of these. That's all I'm going to tell you about it. You want more? Take a physio class. Actually, more importantly, take an anatomy class. We don't need those right now. Other tissue? You got to move. So we call those muscles. These are what we call excitable tissues, meaning they react to electricity. If I take electricity and I take it to your epithelium, any epithelium, what happens? It burns. That's it. How if I take it to some connective tissue? It burns, and that's it. What if I take it to muscles? The muscles do something. They will immediately react. Muscle tissue may or may not be attached to a skeleton. If it's attached to a skeleton, we call it a skeletal muscle. If we find it within a heart, we call it heart muscle, but we want to sound smarter than that. We need a fancy word for heart. Cardiac, so we call it cardiac muscle. The name of the cells, if you want to sound smart. Well, we need a fancy word that means muscle. Myo, M-Y-O. We need a fancy word that for cell, cyte, C-Y-T-E. So if you want to sound super smart about your heart muscles, you call them cardiomyocytes. When you listen to doctors speak, they're just speaking a different language. Just saying. So if you ever, I know most of you want to become doctors, so here's the thing that you need to remember. When you're talking to your patients, they don't speak your language. So you must code switch for them. Because if you don't, you are violating international rules and norms and laws, which is informed consent. If they don't understand the language you're speaking, anything that they sign is not an informed consent. And that can result in people going after you. And going after you includes your medical license. Speak the language they speak, which means if you speak a language other than English, you need to learn the medical version of it too. You will become infinitely more valuable to a company, to a hospital, if you can speak medical English and medical Spanish or medical Vietnamese or medical whatever. Doesn't matter. 
there are three different types of muscle across everything that we look at. We can find three different versions. One of them is called smooth. We call them smooth because they look smooth. We have cardiac, which is called cardiac because we find it in the heart. And skeletal because it's attached to a skeleton. And then uh, some of these require you to control it. Some of these work just fine on their own. Last one, nervous tissue. The catch with nervous tissue is it's not really a tissue, but we call it nervous tissue. The reason why, if you remember from last, from with plants, tissues are when you get an aggregate of cells and they seem to have this special function that all comes together when you have this correct arrangement of these cells. Nervous tissue works on its own. It's kind of a bunch of cells kind of shoved together into a space. So it's a loose association. The one that does most of the heavy lifting is called the neuron. Its helpers are that word. Give it a shot. So typically, the answer you'll hear is glia, which is why the medical dictionary definition or pronunciation is glia. There's a lot of words like that, where you have what everyone says, and then you have the correct way. No one, unless you know, no one's going to judge you for saying it the incorrect way. A lot of them I know the correct way, so I will judge you. Like, this side of your body... It's called the anterior. So this side is called, that's right, posterior, not the posterior. Posterior is the correct term or the correct pronunciation. So if I say posterior, am I wrong? I understood you. So if I understand you, moving on. But technically, it's posterior. Because when it was invented, that's how it was supposed to be said. It's kind of like this word. So this is a cellular phenomenon that involves whenever something's going wrong. So your cells are dividing. Uh-oh, they're dividing incorrectly. What you need to do is take out the cell. So the way you do it is that word. Program cell death. Pronounce the word. So, <laughs> phonetically, you're like, uh, 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 right? Apoptosis, which is why it's apoptosis. <laughs> Just because it's how you think it should be pronounced. If you said apoptosis, I know what you're. I know what you mean. It's not how the word is supposed to be pronounced, but I can follow. It's kind of also like this is an even more horrible one. I'm not adding any of the marks because I can't get any of them right. But if you wanted to go out and get a bowl of pho, we know that it's wrong. But could you figure out what the person was talking about? You could. You're wrong! But it's still enough like, oh, okay. Mi chang, okay, I get it, but... What's mi chang? Yeah, white people. So if you're ever in like Los Saigon, you have you hear someone like uh, it's like I know I can tell. Thank you. I've done that before. Where I've been in a restaurant and I hear Mitang, I'm like I can hear you, and they they freak out. He's like, oh, how does he know our secrets? Anyway, glial cells. But if you said glia, I know what you're talking about. We used to think that they were just there as helper bees, 
they actually do a lot more than we give them credit for. And we're learning about what they do all the time. What are they? We don't care about their names right now. These are also excitable tissues. And they seem to be able to control muscles. We can organize these tissues into organs. Plants have organs like leaf and flower. They just don't have them to the extent that we do because we like wander around all over the place. So they could get away with a handful of organs that can have multiple functions. For us, we're a little bit more specialized. So we get a whole bunch of organs, and typically what we say is we can organize these organs into organ systems. It follows the idea of emergent properties. So one of the things that people like to talk about is, oh, well, you should know as a result of taking this class, the 12, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, the 11, the 11 organ systems. And my response is always, and I have done this before, one of the few times I'll speak up because it's like, mm, uh, no, we need to do this. I'll then say there's not 11 organ systems. He's like, yes, there are. The textbook says. Textbook's wrong. Do you have a PhD? It doesn't matter. The textbook's wrong. Why? Because we know for a fact that this system influences this system. We know what you eat influences your brain. So that's a digesto nervous system. We also happen to know that if something happens to your skin, if you were to burn a certain percentage of your skin, your ability to have an immune response stops. So that's an integio, an integumento immune system. We also know that you can mentally stop yourself from getting sick. Have you never had those times when you're super stressed out and you feel you're getting sick and you're like, not now! You don't need to say it, but you start to feel like, I don't have time for this crap. And then it stops. Like, literally, the illness stops. And the moment you're done, boom, you get it. It's why, always, when it's a vacation week, you're sick. Because you're like, I don't have time for it right now. And your body says, okay, I'll hold it at bay until you can. They interchange. A system is when you have organs that work together for a common purpose. So people like to say, oh yes, here are the 11. Except that I just made other connections where they were working together for a common purpose. So are there 11? The answer is, what a stupid question. That's the correct response. How many organ systems are there? What a stupid question. Because what's an organ system? It's the organs that are working together to do a common purpose, whatever that purpose is. Just because you want to shove them into 11 groups doesn't mean that there are 11. 